Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery is the second film by Ryan Johnson starring Daniel Craig as Benoit Blanc, the detective. In this episode of Costumous Character, I had the delight of speaking to Jenny Egan about returning to work on Glass Onion. But before we delve into that, if you want any more costume content or other videos from Digital Spy, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. One of the things that Jenny was very clear about was that she didn't include any sort of giveaways or hints within the costume design itself. And this speaks to one of the kind of core tenets that she used when designing this film, which is consistency of character. For me, it's always interesting. I think it's, you know, you start first with dressing that person. Who is that person? Because there's so many characters and because we or with them for so long. It's about keeping a consistency. Mm -hmm. So the audience is like, okay, this is that same person. You know, they're not trying to change a persona to be within a different scenario. Mm -hmm. You know, Ryan's script does that so well. So it's really just about me consistently giving him these characters and they're that same person. So there mm -hmm. isn't, you know, a sway either way. So somebody's mm -hmm. not going, well, wait a second. They were wearing this before and, you know, now right. this. What does right. that mean? Consistency of character is so important in a whodunit because and it, the whole story is predicated on these archetypes. When you think back to Clue, you've got Colonel Mustard, you've got Mrs. White, you've got uh, Miss Scarlet. They're colors, right? They're all colors. And obviously, you know, we're not gonna have a film of someone in red and someone in yellow and someone in blue, but you still have to use those design elements to create an idea of a person that when you look at them as an audience member, you can understand something intrinsic about who they are. And so each character has their own sense of style and that is what carries them through the film. If a character happens to be a murderer or a con man or whatever it might be, that would reveal itself in the way the person dresses because it's who they are. An example of this kind of uh, clue in costume design actually comes in The White Lotus season two. Um, spoilers for The White Lotus season two if you haven't seen it. Uh, Tanya, played by Jennifer Coolidge, wears at the end this kind of red and pink and yellow floral dress. And it's actually the exact same dress that's on the mannequin in the car outside the Godfather mansion of the wife who gets blown up in the car. So that's an example of a clue being made in the costume design. Part of the reason that Jenny didn't feel the need to sort of signpost these things to the audience through the costume design is because all of the clues are there in the script already. As Ryan Johnson said, he wanted to play fair. And it goes back to um, Agatha Christie, in fact, in terms of when you get to the end of a whodunit, the, the reveal shouldn't be a surprise. You should be able to go back and either read the book or watch the film for the second time and pick up on all of the little clues and seeds and details that hint at who the murderer is or, or whatever the, the kind of central question might be. In this case, the, the answers are all there if you watch it the second time round. You don't need a kind of neon sign or even a subtle sign from the costume to point you in that direction because it's there in the characters, it's there in the script. Jenny talked about consistency of character, specifically with Benoit Blanc. No, I mean, I sort of found out when everyone did, you know, okay. when Ryan announced that. I mean, you know, it, how, how do you think about that? I, I just always approached him from a perspective of, you know, he's this amazing detective, you know, and has to, and we talked about this, like, you know, Daniel would always say, like, he's been around the world. He's been mm -hmm. with these people. He's done all of these things. He knows how to play the game. Hmm. So there is, you know, with this detective, there is a game involved. Obviously, there's been a lot of conversation around Benoit Blanc's sexuality being confirmed by Ryan Johnson in a press conference. And some people felt like that was uh, being shoehorned in, a kind of uh, pink washing of the film and a way to include LGBTQ representation without really doing the work for it to be there. Um, in terms of my own personal sort of opinion on that, I felt like there were a lot of consistency of character clues within Benoit that reveal who he is. And Ryan Johnson was just kind of putting a fine point on it. It does something quite interesting, which is that it takes away this idea of what a gay person, a gay man dresses like or looks like. Um, and also, 
it speaks to who Benoit is as a character. He's of an older generation, he's from the South, so he carries with him this kind of genteel dandyism, which is what Jenny refers to it as, and that can slip so easily into what we kind of in the 90s called metrosexual and how that sort of influences fashion and personality in these queer spaces and then in general culture. And it's all about the interplay of those things. And so I think Benoit sits at this really interesting cross section of all of those different moving parts. I think that's why you kind of kept it similar throughout. Like, right. you know, he has two suits, you know, that the, the look of it is is the same person. So he's not like effectively going in a, in a different colored suit or a different colored, you know, something crazy for the dinner. You know, right. he's still that same person that landed on that island to the dat. You know, he didn't right. make a crazy change, right. which I think was also the similar thing with the first one. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the neckerchief, it was just kind of his uniform, for lack of a better term. A really good example of where Benoit sits within these uh, kind of the Venn diagram of fashion and sexuality. When they all arrive at the dock, he's wearing a kind of salmon colored shirt with these khaki trousers and then the cravat, which is just super stylish. And it reminded me of a scene in the last season of Gilmore Girls when Christopher and Lorelai have gotten married. What? Um, sorry. And they're doing laundry and she pulls out a shirt that is the exact same color. And she basically accuses Christopher of being self-absorbed and vain because a man who thinks he looks good in a salmon pink peach colored shirt has taken the time to think about what kind of clothes he looks good in. And then that feeds into this idea of like, oh, being vain, self-obsessed and stuff. And I think it's so interesting when you look at the way in which, particularly for men, I think in a way we don't always talk about, fashion says so much because we, we are coded into believing that a way that someone dresses reveals something about themselves, which is true, but also we read into those things then and we take away uh, details about what the other person might be like, whether they're true or not. Thrilled to have you. I mean, relax, enjoy yourself. Hey, try to solve the murder mystery if you can. I don't want to toot my own horn, but it's pretty next level. Speaking of being on the dock, Obviously there was that moment where everyone sort of coalesces there to get on the yacht and because the film takes place during COVID times, uh, everyone's wearing masks. Well, almost everyone's wearing masks. Now obviously that's a really kind of integral uh, part of the character. Again, we go back to consistency of character and the masks that they choose are very much linked to who they are as people, which Jenny explained. Lionel, the scientist, well, of course, he wears the most effective KN95, you know, which is technically. So it was kind of that feeling of who was each of these characters and what mask would they have worn? I think it's about being out in the world and looking at people and seeing, did it matter? Some did, some didn't, you know, did they wear it down? And of course, like Claire's, I mean, even though politician, you need to see her face. So it was kind of always yeah. off always it off and on but of course the beige staying intact and you know i think everybody had their own creative style you know daniel's was still a little bit de debonair and chic and it kind of it went but you know i think they i think everyone thought about it in particular the discrepancy between birdie played by kate hudson and peg played by jessica henwick i thought was super interesting and really uh indicative of their relationship, which I was very fortunate to speak to um, Jessica Henwick about, it isn't the typical sort of assistant and boss relationship dynamic that we've seen. With Birdie and Peg, it's a little more symbiotic, which is something that Jessica uh, Henwick was very interested in bringing to the character. And that's also reflected in the masks that they wear. Some people it's useful and it gets the job done. Some are like, well, if this is gonna be the thing, then I'm gonna make it stylish. Right. So that was kind right. of the way we approached it. And then with Birdie, it was just, what could be the most ridiculous thing we could do? Mm -hmm. You know, what what would be so non-effective, but her going by the rules, because Peg probably forced her to, and right. just roll, Peg rolling her eyes, right. like, no, right. this is something. <laughs> yeah, well, I think Peg didn't ever worry about herself, because there was mm -hmm. so much to worry. I mean, that's how I approached Peg, and, and, and we talked about that, where, you know, yeah, there's a little bit of hipster vibe for her or, you know, the character was that, but it was never a thought about what Peg needed to do. It was like, there was so much work 
and right. getting dirty anywhere that it's like, okay, this, I got, there's the mask I got, yeah. you know, and I can carry, I've got my bag. That's got all my goods, her phone, my, you know, everything was there. Utilitarian. Right. Was basically the thought about Peg and that right. there was not an afterthought. It was too much with Bertie. As a foil to Benoit and his very sort of self-assured nature is Miles Braun played by Edward Norton. And that character is very much dressing for who he wants people to think he is. He wants people to think he's this sort of very intelligent, but at the same time, so intelligent that he's not really bothered about what he wears, but also what he wears is super expensive. So you have all these layers of how he wants to be perceived. And that is really what's driving the clothes that he's wearing, his his choice of, of outfit. When the yacht arrives onto Miles Island, he's sitting there playing the guitar and it's meant to look super casual, like, oh, I always sit on the beach playing my guitar, but obviously it is so staged. And that speaks to something kind of fundamental about who Miles is. He's a character who's creating the character of himself. And as a from a design perspective, that's a sort of double layer of meta costume design, which Jenny talked about in terms of how she built that wardrobe. Well, you know, and Edward, you know, we had a long, great conversation to begin with about these guys. I mean, he spends a lot of time, you know, in his personal life and he knows a lot of these people in Silicon Valley. You know, he, he you know, he said that. And so he kind of knows who these guys are. And there is a lot of there is a world in which, you know, to look you know, like you have nothing is like the, that's rather than going over the top, it's like laying low and underneath it. Look, I don't need anything mm. to be, you know, this grand person. It's all here. It's my mm. brain. It's not about this. And which is quite hilarious because on the other side of it, you've got the glass onion, you've got this massive place, the car that doesn't drive on the island. So there's all, and, and you know, and he said from the beginning, you know, which I thought was so key to helping with this character is, you know, and he, he said it in interviews, but like Miles Braun doesn't have an idea of his own. He's all copying everybody. Like he's playing, you know, the guitar when he arrives and just, oh, look at me. I just live on this beach. I don't need anything. Mm. And, you know, it's just, it, it, I think that's how we approached it. And then it was just keeping him simple because everything else was huge. Another very revealing scene, but I'm, you'll see why I said that in a minute is the pool scene, hooray! Um, and it's interesting because there's, you know, we start off learning about all the characters kind of in their individual boxes when they have their puzzle boxes. And then they all coalesce on the dock and then they all coalesce again at the pool and then they all coalesce again at dinner. So you get these kind of wonderful tableaus of these characters. And in the pool scene, everyone's there. And I, one of the most kind of interesting moments for me watching it was the, interaction between Birdie and Whiskey, because Birdie as a character is used to being, you know, the hot thing, both physically, literally, but also kind of success-wise. You know, she's a model, she's now a designer, she has all this stuff um, to make her a, a person you covet, like you wanna be her a little bit. And then Whiskey turns up and she's younger and she's, you know, more fit in, in the kind of grand male gazy way and all of a sudden you see for really the only time in the film birdie sort of fold into herself and she i think takes her hat or a cover up and she sort of covers herself up all of a sudden birdie and whiskey is something that jenny wanted to highlight because it's a dynamic we see a lot not only in the media but also in real life women are frequently pitted against each other and the film even though it's not saying anything in particular about their relationship or the, the way they interact in terms of the overarching world in which it takes place, that's a, a point that Jenny wanted to make. Is I mean, I think it's quite interesting with women in general. Like, I think we all have a tendency, you know, unfortunately we've been conditioned to say, oh, look at the younger, fitter, you know, version of what I used to be. And we look back at longing or, you know, some sort of negative way mm -hmm. where it's like, I, I'm no longer being looked at like that anymore. We right. kind of just, here. And I thought, what a smart thing for them to play it that way, you know, mm -hmm. because I think we all do that. And for even somebody that is gorgeous as Birdie J, you know, to have that feeling of and her to say, like, I was something, you know, mm -hmm. he didn't he did. He couldn't believe he was in the room with me is what Miles said. You know, she says mm -hmm. that to Peg, you know, I so I think it's that sense of 
that we all women get, you know? And I think it's really unfortunate because I mean, she looks gorgeous. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I, I thought it was quite interesting the way Kate played that it was mm -hmm. really spot on, but you know, I mean, even having the utmost confidence, you know, who Kate does, but she played it so small. Yeah, where, yeah. You know, and I thought, and you know, they're both just wonderful, wonderful characters and, and they played it so well. And I thought, you know, Whiskey's character is so smart. Like mm -hmm. she's smarter than I think we expected her to be. Speaking of hot women, uh, Catherine Hahn, holy crap, she's beautiful. And she's in a lot of beige in the film. And uh, Jenny revealed to me that actually that was in the script. Ryan uh, Johnson wanted her to be in this kind of politician's beige. And what I found quite interesting about that detail is that beige is actually quite a trendy color right now. However, for Claire, it's not a statement the way we can see it in high fashion, it's neutral. It's not a statement. It's the opposite of making a statement, which is exactly what she wants to do as a politician, right? She wants to convey the majority so that she gets elected. And, and so she doesn't want to say anything outrageous about herself through her clothes. But that's also fundamental to who she is as a person because then she goes on vacation and her wardrobe is still basically beige. I think you think about politicians, of course you think about mostly men because they wear suits, but you're never getting, you know, a lot of times you're not getting top of the line. They're not wearing high-end designers. They're finding new designers or they're just the every man. They're buying things that look like everyone else could be because they want to be everybody. So we, I think we, we first did a first fitting with her and it went a little too far. It was a little bit more fun and creative and like Fine. what would what would a politician do on vacation? You know, so we pushed it too far. Like she ordered a bunch of clothes in and it looked ridiculous. And Fine. although Ryan thought it was really funny, it was like, bring it back to, you know, this, she's going on vacation. She has a very set wardrobe, you know, the Ted Talks bag, like everything is usable you know, liberal, you know, cotton, or, you know, that kind of very basic. And, you know, poor Catherine hated me in the end. Not really, but you know, it was really hard for her, I think mm -hmm. with the sunburn and the beige dress that she didn't look, you know, you look over at Kate and, and the beautiful dress, like I want to be pretty too, you yeah. know? But I think it just worked so well for that character. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, just, we had to simplify it a little bit and just be like, what would a politician do in real life? And, you know, they keep this status quo and maintain their base, which is, mm. you know, not standing out amongst the crowd, right. keeping it simple. So that was kind of where we went with her. And, and you know, I mean, you threw in little things like the, the visor. Right. You know, yeah. it was like, you know, you got visors and I was like, well, you know, she'd probably have something to cover. So the sunburn wouldn't do this, but it yeah. was like that one came out and it was like, oh my gosh. And the way she played it, just brilliantly yeah. and everything a little bit disheveled sometimes mm -hmm. like i'm not taking the time and when they're by the pool i thought was the funniest like she yes. obviously wore the robe that he supplied she didn't bring yes. anything else no. well yeah. i do try to pull it together in her brown swimsuit yes yeah. yes <laughs> this is a massive spoiler warning if you haven't seen the movie yet stop watching we love you all go see the film it's great so one of the big reveals in Glass Onion is that Janelle Monae's character of Andy isn't really Andy. Turns out Andy is dead. And the person that Janelle Monae is playing is her twin sister, Helen. Helen is playing Andy. So here you have, again, sort of like we talked about with Miles, you have all these layers of uh, someone presenting themselves as a different character. They're a character building a character. And what was so interesting was Again, Jenny wasn't going to signpost that in terms of the choices of clothes, but instead allowed who Helen as a person was to influence the types of clothes she chose when she was pretending to be her sister. Well, I think we started with Andy because, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and the idea that the audience thinks that this is Andy. So it's like, let's start with Andy because the idea is that Helen would have always got into her closet and taken her clothes. So who is that? You know, and, and the idea that they're twins, that everything will be perfectly fit. And so I think it was started with Andy and creating that character and who that strong, powerful woman was that was there to make a point, you know, and it was all very, you know, strong and, and, and simplistic yet stunning. Like, you know, and I mean, go, like going back to you saying like her looking like that, it was the most intimidating thing, like to meet her and to think mm -hmm. about 
well, you know, and you really, in my job, you really have to step away and say, right, this isn't Janelle Monae that right. we're dressing. Right. And she, you know, and she's so excellent at that. Like there was never a moment that she walked in the room and was like, oh, because of this, I have to be this. It was always about the character, mm -hmm. which I thought was, you know, so amazing. And so, you know, so we started with Andy and then it slowly got to, OK, who is Helen? You know, I think the bigger question wasn't who was Andy, but who was Helen and how do you differentiate enough, which I think with great help from hair and makeup, you know, it's like even the nails are different color, you know, if you check mm -hmm. that, it's simple things, but also like we didn't, I didn't want to make her so simple, like a school mm -hmm. teacher exactly, but she's also grieving, you know, and she's right. searching for this thing, like who's done this to her sister, I can't believe it. And so just keeping it very simple, like on the run, she came in, she had very little. So I think that was in, in the color palette, you know, mm -hmm. Andy's bold and bright and, red but you know at the hotel when she's going through everything with Blanc it's that beautiful yellow dress that was a little bit more of Andy like a a Helen a rather you know, the softer version taking her time to sort of get into who right. Andy and then when she lands on that well we see her first when she lands on the dock but it's just mm -hmm. bold it's like oh there she is and mm -hmm. it, I, you know that dress for me was one of my favorites it's so stunning on her and she yeah. just carries herself so well tonight a murder will be committed my murder once you're dead will we still be able to talk to you yeah i'm not playing dead the whole weekend if you enjoyed this episode of costumes character don't forget to like and subscribe to our youtube channel for more delightful costume content uh if there is a film a show a designer that you'd like us to talk about be sure to leave that in the comments thank you so much for watching